Well, we, we came in 88, and I mean, like everybody that comes here, it's like we went up Wizard, went up Solar, and then I'm two thirds of the way up Seventh, and I just look over at Doug Lundgren and I'm like, holy shit, dude, we've been going up for an hour and we haven't even dropped in yet. We gotta move here. We came down after the first day and rented the last empty shop in town and opened the snowboard shop here. And as soon as we opened it here, everybody from Calgary, like Schwarty, Alex, and everybody, they just moved to Worcester and that was it. Calgary was dead in a day. I came out here, yeah, the summer of 88. Ken Ockenbach was gonna open up a shop and said, hey, you come out here and work in the shop a couple days a week and uh, I'll cover your rent, we'll get a house and stuff like that. So that's where the foundation started. We met with Dano Pendegrass and Gary Pendegrass, which were kind of the two only local snowboarders. So Ken Ockenbach came out and opened the snowboard shop and that was probably in 89. And I met the Ockenbachs and Dave Ockenbach was like a pro snowboarder. And he, he had been on the cover of Transworld Snowboarding Magazine, a thing that I didn't know existed. They had like business cards and shit. It was really weird, but they also had like one piece yellow suits and shit. It was like, I really like this idea. I'm not really sure what they're wearing. And they convinced Whistler to let them go up Whistler. So first of all, I'm like, what the fuck's a pro snowboarder? And second of all is like, how the fuck did they get up Whistler? Because it was banned. Coming from Calgary, we didn't realize how big a deal it was to actually snowboard in Whistler. It was just, you know, another mountain that we got first tracks on. So it wasn't that big a deal until we realized later when Dano was just like, oh, you know, his whole life he's lived here and then some dude from over there comes and beats on the first tracks. <laughs> and even then, they, you know, after we filmed, they still didn't open for a couple of years. So it was like, we rode Black Home, you know, religiously. Snowboard team, I'll have to give credit to, to Ken Ackerbach and the snowboard shop. They were really the founding store out here. That's how it all really started. It was all about Black Home. Whistler was, was getting in the bandwagon, but we fully supported it on Black Home. That was a big difference. They, we embraced the culture. We wanted it to happen over here. We were hitting the sides. We were looking for terrain. Skiers weren't doing that stuff. They weren't even in, you know, they didn't know what we were all about. So you'd see other tracks and go, holy shit, there's another snowboarder here today. And then you'd get to the bottom of the lift and your buddy at the lift would say, hey, there's a snowboarder here. I told him to wait up top, and they would. It was like an instant brotherhood of, of snowboarders because there were so few of us. It was, it was free riding, it was using the natural features. It was the, the wind lift, the quarter pipe. That's how it all really started. First stop, Blackcomb, British Columbia, a spot called Lemmings Leap, named so by locals who watch numerous skiers try to use it as a straight jump, not understanding re-entry. For Chris Roach, a dream come true. A 20 foot high quarter pipe with five feet of vertical. The quarter pipe was rad, but the bigger sessions went off on the, on the wind lift for sure. I remember Damien, he'd go, I'd drive from California for one hit on the wind lift. And, you know, and then you have sessions like, you know, the, the all-time best photo in Transworld or the one of Doug, of Doug just basically falling out of space. I mean, that's the thing, it's like there wasn't parks, so that was the biggest thing you could send it off. After I saw the movie Snowboard in Exile with the, with the wind lip in there, you know, Damien Sanders and Steve Graham just hitting that big wind lip, like big backflip, double backflip. And me and my buddy Pat Van were all like, hey, let's go with that wind lip. So we just quit school and jump in the car and uh, we just drove to, uh, to BC to hit the wind lip. And we never came back. <laughs> so the French Canadian uh, influx happened, uh, I mean, it, it started with Martin Gallant for sure. It had to have. Yeah, the rumor is that Martin learned how to speak English on the drive from Quebec to BC listening to NWA tapes. I like jumps with lots of powder. I try to hit everything that's in my way. When I came from Quebec and I rolled in Whistler and uh, I was just chasing all the guys that live here like Alex Warburton and all these boys and all I do is follow these guys and try to hit the launch behind them. Where's the launch? <laughs> jumps everywhere, it was paradise, so much snow. The first time I came to Whistler was actually in the summer because my brother's friend had already moved, lived in Whistler. They showed us a video. We're like, Whistler Winlet? I want to hear that. You know, there was a lot, of, a lot of folks coming from all over the place. Everybody just migrated to Whistler. That's, no matter whether you're from the West Coast or the East Coast, you were going to come here to be somebody. 
I came out here as one of the first snowboard instructors on the team and had this passion and desire to do something, campaign upper management, and in 1992, 93 seasons give or take, uh, is when they gave me the okay to build a half pipe at the top of the solar coaster chair on Black Hole Mountain. Um, it was a real challenge back in the day, it was still that skier versus snowboarder mentality. In fact, we, had, we even had a hard time even getting a shovel out of the operations team to do it. Uh, we ended up getting a shovel sponsor from a local snow clearing company and they were one of our first sponsors at our first half pipe competition. They put up a big banner to say Snow Ejectors was a snow clearing company and they provided the shovels. It was pretty funny and we, we really kind of turned some heads when we put on the first event and uh, I think we had 64, 65 riders came out and uh, yeah it was really interesting to see how, how it really grew and developed from that point on. One of the things that really separated the, uh, the Whistler scene and I think the reason that it was so instrumental and so central to snowboarding is because of the glacier. There was a, a traveling snowboard, pro snowboard scene that came out and lived with us, you know, like Brushy lived in a hallway. It was just having that influx of really, really talented riders up here and every single session was like tricks were getting kind of copied from skating and, and, and invented and, and the level was just changing constantly. At that moment, we didn't go in the backcountry because Whistler was still like just the backcountry. After a while, you know, you, you hit everything that's to hit or to film on Whistler and the Whistler backcountry was so pristine and wide open. Yeah, there's only so much you can do, I think, on the resort when you go out on your sled, especially back then, there's nobody, there wasn't really nobody out there. The reason I think that we, we, got, we got to the backcountry and with sledding access is just to have something unique. Snowmobiles were the great equalizer, right? It, it changed that idea of who could get to places. It wasn't just like rich film crews or rich sponsors or whatever, it's like anybody could get up there. It was so much easier to go find fresh stuff in the backcountry. But we couldn't, we couldn't leave Brandywine Bowl for years. We spent like seasons shooting in Brandywine Bowl. We'd see like rednecks with turbo sleds going straight up the gauntlet or straight up the S-chutes and we're like, holy shit, man, it's all back there. We gotta get there. But it took a long time to be able to do that. So the S-chute, it's kind of like this, this mystical legend of Whistler backcountry. Welcome to the S-chute. Everybody who comes to Whistler to snowboard or to snowmobile, one day they have to climb this big S Superman shoe. I call it uh, Stitches Alley, because uh, more sled than you can even think of have like so many stitches from that shoe, like rip wood, like tumble, tomahawk. As we see now, there is someone running after a snowmobile down the S shoot we just got here. It's been 10 minutes, man. I don't know how much money got spent on sleds just trying to get through the S-chutes. It was a pretty intimidating front door. The S-chute is uh, it's the, it's the way into the Alpine here. It was always a bit of a shit show back in the day with the old sleds. But once you get up there, you end up up here in the Alpine in Whistler. And one of the first features that you go by is right behind me. It's called the Forum Step Down. It got called Forum Step Down because of the, what movie was it, Resistance? I think Resistance. They all had shots on it, and well, I guess they named it Farm Step Down, and it stuck. Brandywine is probably one of the most famous zones, and in Brandywine alone, there's Farm Step Down, which we're about 500 feet away from. There's like Perfect Jump. There's Huffman Step Down. Those are all like super iconic spots to me, which I knew. I mean, I knew the names of them before I had ever even been sledding before. Like that's how popular they were. Yeah, I mean, you know, jump like like. This uh, forum step down, you can see the progression over the years of what's been done. If you were to put those, those shots back to back with a timeline, you would see the progression of snowboarding just on that jump. The thing with jumps with names, like those ones for example, is when the backcountry snowboarders first, when it first started to become a real thing, like, you know, the sleds were older, it was harder to get out here, so they just went to the spots that they knew worked. And uh, we still hit them to this day because we know they work. That's what gets a lot of people here. It's just like everyone saw it in the movies and it was just kind of like the place to be. If you wanted to like snowboard in the backcountry or like freestyle snowboarding in the backcountry, you had to like go to Whistler. Uh, I, I think the Whistler legacy is the whole cruise thing. Everybody had their crew and uh, the Mad Boys are just like the latest sick crew. You know what I mean? Everybody in there is so good.
it's like you come here and the level is so high that you either step up or you step off. And when you have the attitude that everybody has here, which is like, you know, nobody really cares where you're from, no one cares what your story is. It's like, you want to ride? Yeah, let's go. You just make these friends that last forever. Like I was telling somebody the other day, the neat thing about Whistler and, and snowboarding in general, it isn't the thing at the end, which is never what you think it's going to be. Like the actual and enjoyment of the sport was all the friends you made on the way and the places you went and the laughs and the chaos. You get the whole magic of snowboarding in Whistler. And I don't think there's anywhere like it. And I'd hate to live somewhere else. <laughs> Can you imagine it? <laughs>